I grew up on a boat. My dad was a same boat operator when I was a kid. He had a gill netter for a couple of years, went back seining. I started seining as a 13 year old with my dad and then as a 14 year old with some um, other relatives. And I, commercial fishing is just part of my identity. It's part of who I am. And going gill netting now is my way of staying connected to my past, but also having fun. I enjoy it. It's one of my happy places. And I stopped commercial fishing in 2007. And then, and then it's what, 15 years later or so. Yeah, 15 years later, and I'm still fishing. So I enjoy, I enjoy that part. It's just, it just means I, I, you know, I can have a family connection. I can have a, you know, occupational connection. I can just go out and have fun. I was probably like somewhere between five and eight years old. Um, I don't really remember it, but I'd be on the top deck of my dad's boat and then the crew would be down on the deck doing whatever or you know relaxing between sets and i'd yell down to them hurry up you guys highball or something like that and they'd look around and even back then my voice sounded like my dad so they thought my dad was telling them to do something <laughs> and it was me and they'd look up and see it was me and they'd curse me and chase me around and <laughs> i interrupt their nap or something like while they're waiting for a, a set and but that was the first kind of knowledge of what I was doing on the boat. I would have been around 12 and my dad had a gill netter at the time and we were fishing um, in the deep water bay area, Campbell River, but we also were fishing in the Fraser. We were fishing day on and day off and we were tied up in Granville Island every night. And, and um, so for that summer, I was, you know, my dad's deckhand gill netting down there. Um, in, in August and in July up in in Johnson Straits and the lower end of Johnson Straits. And at the next year, my dad got an offer to run a same boat. Um, and I went out, I wasn't crew, like my dad inherited the crew in the boat. Um, somebody needed to be replaced. And so my dad filled in and I went out and this was back in the days when the skiff was powered by oars, not by outboard motors like it is now and really old school, right? You know, wooden skiffs with oars. And um, the skiff man I had uh, just wasn't up to par. And my dad told me to swap out with him. And, and I started working like the last three weeks of August for my dad because the adult person couldn't do a good a job as the 13 year old. And then at 14, um, my dad went back crewing and um, I jumped on one of the other relatives boats from Cape Mudge and, and that launched my 20 some odd year career as a commercial fisherman. You know, I, I've heard of stories from some of the 
um, relatives or, you know, especially the old timers um, in a village who gilded it by hand. And nowadays, everybody gilded nuts on a, a modern boat that's bigger, like usually 30 feet or more with hydraulic equipment and a drum. I'm out there in a 15 foot speedboat um, with an outboard motor and, and a gill nut that I pull in by hand. As far as I know, I'm the only one that does it in this area, whether it's here off Comox or up in Campbell River, Quadra Island. I haven't seen anybody do this and definitely not anybody doing this in, in the weather that I've done it. You know, I probably half the time I'm out there, whether it's October or August, it's usually a small craft morning and I shouldn't be out there, but I am. <laughs> I don't, I probably was a kid and, and knowing that my dad was telling stories about his family and his father. Um, so my father's dad, so my grandfather, his name is Frank Asu. Um, my grandfather was 18 years old approximately. He was gilling by hand on the Fraser River in a rowboat that also had a sail. And the, the boat was um, a Columbia River style uh, boat. So down in the US, um, like Columbia River, that's in between Washington state and, and Oregon state. Um, they had this design and, and the design of these boats made its way up to Canada. And he was operating this at 18 years old. It was probably in the last 10 or 12 years off and on, we've talked about it that you know, my grandfather was doing gilding by hand and now I'm doing gilding by hand. You know, I started off gilding with my father on his more modern boat with a drum and, and uh, like, you know, mechanical stuff and graduated from that into same boats, wooden same boats into fancy aluminum same boats. And now I'm into kind of not regressing, but retracing history and going back to doing it by hand. And it's a more traditional way of doing things. Um, and I think it's more sustainable, you know, I'm, I'm not polluting as much, you know, uh, my foot, environmental footprint is a lot smaller than a bigger boat, even a gill nutter. I guess it was really special to know that, you know, I I never met my grandfather. He died when he was 50 and he, you know, he's died in 1958. I, I was born in 73. So there's a big gap between um, that. I only knew my grandmother. To have that connection of knowing not only am I named after my grandfather, but I'm doing the same type of work that he's done in his life makes it pretty special. just uh, a knife that we use for making gawas and gawas is um, basically fish jerky. This was my grandmother's knife and it was passed down to me by my father probably 25 or so years ago. I started taking over like the fishing duties for my family. So even when I was still living with my parents as you know early, late teens early 20s I started to do the fishing my dad was starting to get out and start retire so i built my first smokehouse on their property and you know i was still fishing so i was bringing back all the, the salmon and stuff and so they gave me this knife my mom probably used it more than my dad um, and then i started to get into it and i haven't used it in a few years so it's it's now just a piece of my grandma I don't know how old it is. I'm guessing it's probably close to 100 years old. Maybe my grandfather made it. Could be, I don't know. But it's one of the last few things that I can physically touch that I know my grandma touched.
So my family traditionally smokes chum, and that's what I've been taught as our culturally our, our village's main um, primary source of food was the chum salmon. Um, and what we smoked uh, quite a bit. And one of the reasons for it is, is you know, it was more accessible. We, you know, we didn't have, we had pinks and, and springs and coas going up the Campbell River and chums will be going by. Um, but the chum is a fairly big salmon species. It's probably, you know, in abundance wise, it's not as much as sockeye or pinks in, in volume, but they're definitely bigger than both of those. Um, and not as big as a spring or coho can get fairly big, but there's not as many of those. So even traditionally, like 100 years ago, there's chum were more prevalent. So they became um, what I was brought up to be told in our village was chum was the, the one that we traditionally smoked and it was thicker. And so we could take off the gawas from those chum and then we uh, it would be left with a more uniform uh, filet, and that would be what we use for our main meals for smoking, and the gawas is our snacks out of that. So. So when I stopped fishing on the same boats, I lost access to food fishing. Um, and I lost access to that ability to get salmon. And I wanted to be reliant on myself. I didn't want to be dependent on other people. And so getting a boat this size was more about convenience, but also money. Like I didn't have the money to buy a gill netter of my own. I didn't have the money to buy a full size net and, and pay for the fuel and the upkeep. I was able to scrape together the amount of money to buy this boat and, and motor and a trailer and you know outfit the, the little gill that I have or gill nets I have but over time I wasn't spending all this at once and even if you add it all up it's not a lot of money in the grand scheme of things of a, a commercial setup but if I go out there for a day on my boat I might burn a half of tank of fuel which is you know 10 liters of gas and you know it's pretty economical um and you know i can just drive up from my house it takes me about an hour and a half to get to the boat ramp another you know half hour to get unloaded and jet over to quadra island uh, it's pretty pretty easy for me to get out there and i'm not paying for mortgage i'm not paying for all these expenses most people who are doing gill netting now that they're for food fishing anyway they're doing it when they're not commercial fishing of some kind. So their fees are taken care of by their commercial costs and stuff. And, and whereas I don't have that to offset my own thing. So this is an economical way for me to stay connected to the fishing industry. You know, I only have a net that's 50 fathoms long. It's only 25% of a typical commercial gill net length. Um, so I need to have space where I know I'll have better success. The first step, first thing I do is I check for where the current is going. So I'll, I usually fish in three spots. Um, one at the very end of the point, one kind of a quarter of the way in, and then the one I go to that's almost all the way into the bay. And I'll go find the kelp and I'll look for which direction the kelp's moving. That tells me which way the current is flowing. So that gives me an indication of how I set the net. So um, if I don't set it in the proper way, then the net will drift on itself in a way that won't be as productive. So because my net's so short, I also need to be placed almost perfect going out. So I usually wanted to have um, in a kind of a half moon shape 
um, thing going straight straight across is is not as successful. Some people will have like S's and curves in their nets, but they that's the the big guys on the you know the gallanters with the long nets. But um, for me, it, it's more important I think because I only have a limited amount of time with my little net to catch it catch them right. So that's the first thing I do is just go to the kelp. Being in the commercial fish industry, I, I was always able to get my own fish. Um, and when I left, uh, I didn't want to be dependent on, you know, somebody else providing for me. I, and I, it, for me, it was not really pride. It was more of, I wanted to do it on my own. And I also didn't want to stand on the dock waiting in lineups. Not that joining the line is anything wrong with it because there's hardly any fishermen out there. So lines are, are are gonna be expected nowadays. And the way things have gone, there's no more lines now. Like the, the Adelaide Fisheries Commission, they go and deliver fish now to elders at least. And and to the, the non-elders, they, they say, here's where you can pick up your fish. Um, and it's almost like a quota system now for our people. Whereas in the past, there wasn't a limit on how much we can get. For me, I wanted to be able to be self-sustaining and independent as well. And doing it this way offers me that ability to be independent still and, and the ability to go out and connect to what I used to do a couple times a year. So for me, it's more about enjoying while I'm out there and then also being able to provide for myself while enjoying it. I really couldn't have done this without so many other people, you know, whether it's my dad's and, and the experience that I've had, you know, him helping build my net, one of my nets, or people like Tim who, you know, conversations and providing me equipment and, and um, the ability to build a net. Um, that's just getting ready to do that. And then when I'm out there, you know, I was never alone. There's been days where I'm fishing alone, but um, there's always somebody from my village um, who's been out there fishing, whether it's on the same boat or my cousin who's running the test fishing boat for DFO on the same boat or other gill netters, they're always around and they're always happy to chat. They're always happy to, you know, check me out because some of them haven't seen me in a few years because I've been, you know, it's been 20 some odd years since I moved away from our, my village. Um, and that might have been the first time they see me. So they're, they're curious. What are you doing out here in this little boat? So we, we it's an opportunity to catch catch up and chat and then you know they're giving me tips so you should try over here you know or you should go into the bay a little more and all these people have influenced how I've fished over the last 15 or 16 years and I really couldn't be here without them or the people that come with me it's not just me going out here I, I just happen to own the equipment but it's bigger than I like I've, I've turned my small family and my extended friends and stuff into a bigger circle that has enabled me to be where I am today.